Welcome back. I'm now going to talk about propositional logic as a formal system. This is a very short introduction to propositional logic based on the slides from Van Fokking from the course Logic and Sets. Propositional logic is a formal system to allow you to talk about propositions. You will probably ask what a proposition is. A proposition is a declarative sentence, which is a statement that can be either true or false. So grass is green can be true, or grass is green can be false in propositional logic. We can combine these statements to more complex statements such as grass is green and roses are blue. Think of another example, five is bigger than three or five is smaller than three. These would be two propositions that can be either true or false. We can also combine even more uh, statements into, for example, implications. So if x is bigger than one, then x squared is not the same as x. So these are typical examples of propositions. Again, think of them as something that you can assign a value true or a value false. Let's look at an example from the real world and how we can go from an, a real world situation to some kind of abstraction so that we can apply logical reasoning. So the first example is Jane. She arrives by train late and there are no taxis at the station. If this is the case, then Jane will be late for her meeting. So this is one of the knowledges we have that if the train is late, there are no taxis at the station, then she will be late. But we also know that Jane is not late for her meeting, even though we know that the train did arrive late. So therefore, human beings can conclude that there were taxis at the station. So now this is the kind of reasoning that we also want to formalize and that we allow Computers, for example, that apply this formal system to do as well. How do we do this? We have a key of the translation to translate parts of the knowledge into proposition. So a train arrives late is something that can be true or false. So we let's call it P. We also have a statement that taxis are at the station that can be true or false. So let's call it Q. And Jane is late for the meeting. Yes or no, true or false, so let's call it R. So basically we abbreviate facts from the story into propositions. And then we can abstract over the knowledge that we have about the situation. For example, that if the train arrives late and there are no taxes at the station, then Jane is late for the meeting, into the abstraction P and not Q, then R. Let's look at this in a little bit slowly. So R was that Jane is late for the meeting, P was that the train arrives late and Q was there are taxis at the station. So what do we know? We know that the train arrives late, so P. We know that there are no taxis at the station, so not Q. And we know that Jane is not late for the meeting. So that is then the next statement called not R. The third one Bit of information is that the train did arrive late. So that is basically the proposition P. And on these three facts, so the rule that we have that if P and not Q then R, if we know that not R, and if we know that P, then we can conclude Q, namely that there were taxis at the station. Let's look at another example also from real life and see how to abstract over these this story. If it is raining and John did not take his umbrella with him, then he will get wet. Second fact is John is not getting wet. The third one, it is raining. So human beings again can conclude that John did take his umbrella with him. We translate this again into propositions, namely P would be it is raining, Q, John takes his umbrella with him, and R, John is getting wet. Again, if we now abstract using those propositions over the story about John, then we know that if it's raining and John did not take his umbrella with him, then he will get wet, which is the same as to say if P and not Q, then R. We also know that John is not getting wet, so the proposition R has to be false, so not R holds. And finally, we also know from the story that it's not raining, so P must be true. And from these three things, we can conclude that Q 
is also true, namely that John did take his umbrella with him. Let's formalize the argument. So in both of the examples, we have some propositions P, Q and R. For Jane, the train is late means P. For John, it's raining is P. And both arguments come to the same abstraction, namely that if P and not Q, then R, and not R, and P, if these three statements are true, then we can derive that Q must also be true. And this gives us a logical formalization, namely P and not Q implies R, and not R, and P together imply that Q. And the interesting thing is now that the validity of these arguments is not due to the fact that we know anything about trains or rain or umbrellas. No, it's purely on the logical form. And we will show how you can show that this statement, this logical formalization, is actually valid. So for whatever propositions P and Q and R you choose, the formula will always be correct, will always be true. The further actual content of the proposition P is not essential in this case. And this is basically the, what we will use also whenever we deal with data and knowledge, that the validity of the things that we can derive and entail follows from the logical form and from the agreed upon semantics and not from some interpretation of what we believe the content is meant to be. So here is really the core of the usage of a logical system, a formal system, that the semantics, that the, the knowledge is fixed, the meaning is fixed of the statements that we make. So propositional logic is a simple example, so let's look at the language, both the syntax, the semantics, and the calculus. For me, a formal system really has always these three elements, that you need to specify all the languages that are correctly written down in a, from, a, from a structural perspective. For all of these sentences that are correctly written down, you can then assign some semantics, some meaning. So you can say that the proposition P and Q is true or it's false. And then you basically also want an algorithm, a calculus, that tells you for a given value, for example, of P and Q, whether P and Q is true. So we want to unambiguously specify all the correctly written down sentences in a language, that's the syntax. We want to assign a meaning to these sentences and we want to calculate the value for those automatically. And I will try to show you how this works in propositional logic. In order to specify all the correctly written logical formulas in propositional logic, we start out with the basics, the atoms of this language, namely the propositional variables. Usually you start out with a finite set of of uh, atomic terms, and in propositional logic that's no different. You start out with your propositions, and in this case we use letters P, Q, and R, but it could also be capital P1 and P2 and P3. It doesn't matter as long as you take a finite set of possible variables. And then you want to combine those variables into more complex formulae. And you do that by using and applying connectives. So you have the connective, a proposition is true, and another proposition is true. So if P and Q, then P and Q is also a valid, a correctly written down proposition or formula. If you have a disjunction, uh, you want to say that either the one or the other is true. For the disjunction, it's a bit tricky because you have two different way of understanding disjunction the OR letter this is, the OR operator, the OR connective. If we talk to human beings and we say it's raining or the sun shines, that we usually mean that it cannot be both. If you, want, if you say, do you want uh, uh, sugar or cream in your coffee, then usually people have the choice of both. So the OR could be 
either or. It could be both. So the other example would be if you ask uh, in a pub, you go to the pub and you ask uh, uh, your neighbor, do you want uh, wine or beer? And you usually don't want him to give you both or uh, to ask for both. So the classical or, which is the written like the V, usually means that you have either the one or the other or both. And the third option is the second option is the exclusive or, which means either the one or the other, but not both. So then you have the fourth connected, which is negation. So not the one, not the proposition. The proposition itself, P must be false if not P holds. We have the connectives uh, implication, one I used in the beginning, and we have some uh, uh, implication in both directions. So the equality, the, the, the um, uh, biconditional, as it's called. There are many constructs that are not in the scope of propositional logic. There is the existential quantification, there exists something, or a universal quantification for all, uh, which uh, some of you will have seen in first order logic, in, in uh, predicate logic. I will mention this later. Um, but for the moment, we really want to restrict to those six operators above. We also don't want to talk about uh, more epistemic uh, notions, knowing something, or a more modal uh, notions such as must or may, always, eventually, temporal notions. These are more in the scope of uh, modal logics. We want to focus on these six connectives above. And to be very honest, I will in this short introduction really only use very simple conjunction, disjunction, and uh, implication may be. So how do you define a syntax of a language, of a declarative uh, language? You start out with your propositional formula. And uh, the definition we give is that is an inductive one, as it's called. So basically, you define your set of valid sentences, of correctly specified sentences, I should better say, correctly written down sentences as containing at least all the propositional variables. So whenever you have a propositional variable, it is a correct formula. And then comes the induction step. And that is basically that if I have a formula, as complicated as it might be, then the negation of this formula is also a formula. The second step is that if I have two formulae, phi and psi, then the conjunction is a correctly specified formula. And the disjunction is a correctly specified formula. And the uh, exclusive or between these two formulae is correctly written down and so forth. So this is an important part that you understand that given these two criteria, namely every proposition formula is, a, every proposition variable is a formula. And then whenever I have a formula, I can extend it with one of the operations. And the final condition is that we take the smallest set that has all these properties. Then we have a correct specification of all the correctly written down formulae for the proposition logic already. There are two things I want to say about it. The, the first one is, uh, this is something really I think uh, needs a bit of practice and we'll do that in one of the exercises. But I want to, um, to you to be aware of the fact that this is a sort of an arbitrary choice of how do we write down these correctly specified, correctly written down formula. There might be different ways of doing this for the same formula. And this is something we will use later. We will see later when we work with uh, knowledge graphs and data languages that for different purposes, for different reasons, uh, different sy syntaxes are used. So we better get used to this now. So let me give you an example of different syntaxes for the same uh, propositional formula. The first one is that we can have different symbols for the operators. So instead of talking about, I try to see this with the, the, the pointer here, instead of having a disjunction, the V sign, we can all have a bar, which is in some programming languages, the sign for disjunction. And for the conjunction sign, 
we use the AND symbol. For the implication, we have a, uh, a necessarily, we don't have a proper arrow, but we have a minus and a, and a bigger than sign. And for the negation, we just have the minus sign. So we have just used different symbols and this will occur pretty often. I will do this because I don't have uh, proper symbols here for my uh, not as nice symbols as, as Van has. Um, so I would probably mostly use these kind of symbols. There's another alternative in the definition I just gave you before. Uh, there are parentheses in each of the steps. So instead of saying uh, negation phi is a formula, it says that negation psi, uh, phi with the brackets around is a validly written down formula. So basically when you apply this definition, you will get enormous amounts of parentheses, brackets. And in many cases, we can unambiguously leave out the brackets. So because we know, because there's an agreement and it's also formally specified that uh, there is a different types of binding for the operators, we can leave out the parentheses. In this case, the, we know that the conjunction, the end sign has to be applied first before we apply an implication and also the negation has to be applied first. Make sure that if you leave out the parentheses, that it is clear for a computer program or for another user to really understand which formula you mean. And that by writing down the formula that I have written down here, I mean this formula and not one where the C implies D takes priority. Another thing Another way of writing down is not only having different symbols and parentheses, but could also be to change the order. So the definition you've seen here is called infix notation because you have the, the operators in the middle in the, oper in the formula, but there could also be a prefix order. So I want to do a little quiz uh, and uh, I want to do this quiz based on the syntax, the prefix syntax, syntax um, which starts with an operator and then has the arguments. So um, given an inductive definition of propositional logic in prefix semantics, this is the task. A formula is a list starting with the operator and then continuing with all the formulas to which the operators apply. So let's have a quiz and then let's see and come back. Here's the answer to the question. The task was to write a grammar or an inductive definition for propositional logic in prefix format. So we wanted a formula to be a list. And if it's a complex list with an operator, then it should start with the operator and then have formulas, so lists, to follow them in the argument positions. So how do we do this? We start out again with the set of atomic propositions. So that is just a set P1, P2 and so forth. And now if something is an atomic proposition, then we want the list containing P to be a valid formula. If I have now two formulae phi and psi in my language, then I want the following construction to be in my language. The conjunction, for example, and then a list phi and a list psi. And this should be in my language. And the same obviously holds for this junction and the negation. So let me give you an example how that works. So if we have a formula P1 and P2 or not P3, then we want this to be translated into a list of lists of formula. And basically you start with the one that is the most, has the highest priority, that is the disjunction here. So we have a list containing the disjunction and then we need the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We start with the left-hand side, 
and we recursively apply the algorithm and we say it has to start with the conjunction symbol and then a list p1 a list p2 and then this list for the left hand side is done and we need the list for the right hand side and that starts with a negation symbol and a list just containing p3 and then we are done Okay, we've seen a pro uh, uh, now for propositional logic, uh, the syntax, we've seen different ways of uh, uh, specifying correctly written down formulae. And now the question of course is, can we give a meaning, an unambiguous meaning to these formulae that we can now write down? And this is called the semantics. And in propositional logic, this semantics is based on the truth values. So truth values in uh, propositional logics can be true and false because we talk about propositions. And these truth values T and F, they correspond to the truth and falsehood, falsehood respectively. And we will assign values T or F to each propositional formula that there is out. The truth value of a composite formula like phi and psi is determined by the truth value of its components. So basically we can construct the truth value of a formula by just combining the truth values of the components of a formula. And for each of the connectives in this language, this functional behavior is expressed by a truth table. So let's look how this works. So if we have a negation, not phi, then we know that it is true if the formula phi itself is false and false if phi is true. So basically this is written down in the truth table down here. Phi gets two possible values, t and f. And then not phi, by definition, has to have the value f if phi is true and t if phi is not true. If we look at a more complex formula, namely a conjunction, phi and psi, then it's true if both of the truth values for phi and psi are true. And it is false in all other cases. So let's write down the truth table again for these possible values for phi and psi. So if phi is true and psi is true, then phi and psi is also true. If phi is true and psi is false, then the conjunction phi and psi is false. If phi is false and psi is true, then the conjunction is necessarily false. And if both are false, then the conjunction is also false. So you always start out with listing all the possible truth values for all the possible combinations of assignment values for the propositional, for the original formula. So now let's take another quiz. What are the truth tables for disjunction, exclusive disjunction and implication? And I've given you three truth tables here. And the question is now, which of them is the one for disjunction? Which of them is the one for exclusive disjunction? And which one is the one for implication? So make sure that you pause here and that you try to get your answers. So which of the one A, B or C is disjunction, which of them is exclusive disjunction and which of them is implication. And this means there's time for another quiz. The answer is that A is the exclusive or B is the disjunction and C is the implication. Why is this so? So if you see at the truth values for both of them true at in letter A, then it basically means that this is false and that is uh, the definition, was the definition of the exclusive or. And in the case of the disjunction, it doesn't matter. And if they are both true, then the standard disjunction in propositional logic is also true. 
So basically what we have now seen is a way to combine the tooth values for complex formulae and uh, we can for each formula now assign a value based on an assignment of truth values to the proposition of variables. And this assignment is called evaluation. So if you take P and Q as proposition of variables and they are both true and R to be false, then you can, based on the complex truth tables that we've seen before, you can derive the truth value of the entire formula P or not Q implies R. And as I said before, you have to be careful that there is no parenthesis here, so no brackets, but usually the disjunction has a higher priority, so P or not Q is calculated first. So we have to calculate what is the truth value for P and not Q. Because P is true, P or not Q is also true. So since R is false, it also follows that P or not Q implies R is false because it basically means that true implies false, which is false. And this is something we can also check again via a truth table. So this is how this is done then in the truth table. You write down all the possible valuations in one of the truth tables for a formula for each of them in, each, in, in one line each in your table. So you start out with P, Q and R, where all of them are true. And then basically you go on through all the possible combinations. So if P is true, Q is true, R is true, then we know that the component not Q is false. We can then, for the component, the part of the formula P or not Q, we can then also calculate whether it's true or false. In this case, it's true because P is true. And then for P or not Q implies R, we can also calculate whether it's true because basically the question is whether true implies true, which is the case. And we do this for all of the possible valuations, all the assignments for variables P, Q and R. So true, P is true, Q is true, R is false, means that not Q is false, P or not Q is then true, and because R is false, the implication is also false. So this way we can calculate all the values for the formula P or not Q implies R based on all the possible assignments. In order to check whether there is a possible true value, true assignment, we need, in the worst case, to go through all the possible assignments. Also, if we want to check whether a formula is always true, validity, as I will explain later in a minute, uh, we also have to go through all the possible truth values of all the assignments. And this is a big problem, because for this very simple formula with three lines, uh, with three variables, we have already two to the power of three values uh, to check um, lines in the truth table. So now the question is, how many lines has the truth table for a variable, uh, a formula with n variables? And um, we have a little quiz on that. So the answer is relatively simple. As we said, uh, you need two to the power of uh, the number of variables lines in your truth table. So if you have nine variables, you need two to the power of nine lines to check. And this is 512. A truth table with n variables has two to the power of n lines. So if you have 10 variables, which is not that much for a real world problem, you have already 1024 different lines that you have to check. So now based on the notion that we can assign a truth value depending on an assignment for a formula, we can check whether two formula are semantically equivalent. So formula phi and psi is semantically, uh, two formulas phi and psi are semantically equivalent if they have identical columns in the truth table. So you just have to check whether they exactly have the same values whenever you check for all the assignments. Here in this case, we show that P implies Q 
and not P or Q are exactly the same because you get exactly the same truth values. A very important notion in logic is the one of validity or tautology. And that basically means that a formula is always true. And this is defined as always have a T in every line in the truth table. So a tautology is true for every evaluation, for every assignment that you can think of. So if you have P or not P, then this would be an example for tautology because either p is true or p is false, so the truth table is always true. So here is an example, p implies q implies p, uh, and we have the truth table, so let's check, q implies p is true if p and q are both true, or if q is false but p is true, so whenever one of the two is true, it is basically um, no, that's not correct, apology. Um, so in the third example, it's um, whenever Q is false, the statement is true, and there's only one way to make it false, and that is if um, P is false and Q is true. So now look at all the cases where P is true, which is the first two ones, and you will see that the statement is always true. Look at the ones where P is false, and then you will also see that the statement is always true. So you get a table that has only true values. The next notion that is important is a contradiction, and that basically means um, that um, a formula is always false, it's always interpreted to be F, and here is another example where you can easily check for all of the valuations, all the assignments that the formula is true, is false. So now we come to the most important notion, in my view, on in these formal systems and in propositional logic, and that's the one on semantic attainment, because uh, this is the one that we will also use later for uh, when we talk about our databases and our knowledge graphs. And the formula phi is semantically entailed by premises phi1, phi2, and phi n. If uh, every evaluation that makes all the formulas of phi1 to phi n true also makes psi true. So always, if the premises are true, then the conclusion phi is true as well. And always is in the sense of every line of the corresponding truth table for proposition and logic. There are other notions for semantic entailment, but basically it's always on the notion of for every assignment that makes the premises true, it also makes the conclusion true. And this is really the core of logical reasoning for not only propositional logic, but many other logical systems. And again, we can use truth tables to check entailment, and we will do this for the Jane John example from the beginning of this lecture, where we start with uh, the formula P and not Q implies R, the fact not R and P, and we have to show that Q is now true in all the assignments that make the first three formula true. So let's see what is the assignment that makes P true, if we start with the last one. That's obviously the first four ones. So we don't need to look at the last four at all anymore. So which of the first four makes not R true? So that's the ones where R is false. So we only have to look at the second and the fourth. And finally, which of those makes P and not Q implies R true? And this is only the second line. So basically, we only have to check one assignment, and this is the second line of this table, and we see that in this case, Q is true. So basically, we have now shown that in all the assignments that make all the three conditions true, Q is also true. So basically, Q is entailed by this knowledge base. If you turn this around, you can also think of counterexamples. So um, 
the entailment does not hold if there exists evaluation v such that all the premises are true but not the conclusion and this validation this this assignment is then called a counterexample and of course there comes a quiz so you can check now using truth tables whether these two semantic containments are valid namely p implies q and not q entails not p and the second one is p or q entails p implies q so please check those in a quiz and then we come back here so this was uh, the part on semantics and now the the element of calculus is one which in propositional logic is so closely related to the truth tables that I will not spend time on this. So in many, um, in many algorithms, you try to be as efficient as possible. And this is the biggest problem in, in the propositional case when you do with, deal with um, truth tables. Because as we said, the, you will always have to check for validity, for example, all the rows in a table. And this is already very big. If you have 10 variables with thousands of lines, if you have hundreds or hundreds of thousands of variables, then this simply doesn't work anymore. So in this case, we need to come up with very uh, efficient algorithms to calculate over all these possible assignments for truth values, for propositional logic. And there are algorithms like uh, Davis-Putnam or resolution, that uh, people have done research on, but they are a little bit outside the scope of this, um, of this little course into propositional logic. So this is all I wanted to say about propositional logic.